Remediating vulnerabilities. Okay, so you have a vulnerability, you've identified something, so now you essentially have to <laughs> solve the problem, right? So let's go ahead and talk more about how you would um, identify, well, you've already identified it, so now how do you uh, identify it? How do you interpret it? Uh, how do you take the appropriate steps, essentially? So again, um, you know, the approach that you take to remedy a vulnerability could definitely make a big difference in the uh, amount of time that you spend uh, dealing with it and, and also to the extent of possible, um, you know, damages or concerns that could come out of it. So, so when you're looking at remediating, um, uh, you know, when, you, when you're looking at remediating vulnerabilities or dealing with threats, uh, you, you really need to understand how to respond to them. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, what we, we really want you to know. So one of the things you need to do, of course, is to prioritize your response actions. Now, hopefully you're using some kind of tools, um, monitoring tools, vulnerability scanners, uh, monitors, whatever, to help identify issues. Now. One of the challenges that uh, that comes up is sometimes uh, you get a lot of noise. So with the monitoring tool, uh, you really need to understand the metrics that are being reported and how those results are really coming at you. So you want to validate the results. So make sure you understand what the results mean. Don't get alarmed by red and yellow and pretty colors and stuff sometimes. Sometimes those could mean, you know, that there is a problem, but sometimes maybe it's more of, um, uh, you know, a threshold issue or setting you need to look at. So when you get a report, for example, generally those vulnerabilities that are detected are generally assigned a risk. So what you want to do and if we go over to the next page, actually, you could see here that this is an example of a, a Nessus vulnerability scan. So again, for example, you want to prioritize your scans. You want to prioritize, uh, you know, the hosts, for example, that, that you see here, the top hosts. You can look at vulnerability comparison, the OS comparisons and, and the host count. Then up here, it tells you the current vulnerabilities. So you can see that it's prioritizing these. Again, um, sometimes the higher risk, uh, you know, again, may not be as high as it would appear. Maybe it's just affecting um, a specific type of a video driver or something that isn't super critical to your organization. Maybe it's on a supply machine or something that's not really used. But again, if it is a vulnerability, you probably want to deal with it. So again, prioritize your results. You want to validate your results as well. So generally with all these reports and monitoring tools, uh, you want to try to identify, you know, the, you know, the real vulnerabilities from the noise. So for example, you know, could very well be that uh, you have a failed Windows update or something, and that could be considered critical. Um, and, and again, you know, should every failed Windows update be a vulnerability? Not really, but again, that's up to you to, to determine how to manage that. So when you're validating results, you really want to uh, do two things, or actually three things. Is, is the first thing is you want to recon reconcile results. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, my throat's acting up here. Uh, but again, you want to recognize um, what, what, what the results are. So reconcile those results. So reconcile means what? If you get a scan that suggests the presence of some kind of vulnerability, so like with the Equifax hack, you know, basically they've identified that you know, they had issues with some of the Apache tool sets. Again, they, they, they identified it. They knew about it, didn't handle it immediately. But again, that's up to you to prioritize what is important. So again, if it keeps on coming up, uh, it's up to you to address that. 
review the logs. So one thing is, is that uh, all the scanners have log files. Double check those. Make sure you understand the data sources as well. Because one of the things uh, that could be important to understand is where is the, the data source coming from? So check check that out as well. And then compare that to like the best practices. So look at the frameworks that you're using. If you're using the NIST cyber framework, great. If not, maybe using CSA, whoever the um, organization is. Um, you want to use the appropriate frameworks for whatever you're doing. Um, for example, if you're an organization that uses ISO, you probably need to use ISO to be fully compliant. But again, that's up to you to determine in your organization. So let's go over and talk about the SANS InfoSec. Now, SANS, of course, uh, is a fairly well um, regarded and, excuse me, uh, well regarded and um, respected organization. Now, when you check out SANS, uh, again, take a look at the resources that they have. They're going to have information on threats and vulnerabilities. They'll have tools available as well. And again, uh, look at uh, the tool sets that they have available and, and determine what is appropriate for your organization. And the link for SANS is, uh, is of course, uh, after the module here. False positives. So one of the challenges that will come up pretty much just about all the time, every, as a matter of fact, pretty much every time you run a scan, is that there, there will likely be some false positives. Now, a false positive is what? These are generally be, uh, be a, um, a result of typically a scan, and maybe that scan isn't actually scanning for what you, know, you want it to scan for. Typically, a lot of these um, tools, they update themselves automatically or you're not familiar or reading the documentation on what to update. And so maybe you don't care if you have the latest Windows Service Pack or not. Um, may, you know, again, it could be a false positive. Um, check your baselines. You know, a lot of things are, are critical to take some time to, to deal with. So, for example, a scanner, right, could use heuristic analysis. And sometimes if there's a change, for example, in usage patterns, that could also set off a false positive. Also, too, sometimes scanners, too, um, you know, will not be able to distinguish between, like, the different account privileges. So, for example, an administrator should be able to to change file directory permissions, whereas a standard user may not. So sometimes it'll say accounts, you know, have, um, you know, administrator access. Well, of course it does, because that's your administrator account. So sometimes these things happen, so just be aware of that. Okay, exceptions. Now, you want to identify areas that, uh, that you need to create exceptions for, this will reduce the amount of false positives, hopefully. Analyzing metrics. Now, one of the challenges that can come up is trying to determine how to analyze the metrics. Now, I know one of the, the typical concerns that I usually run into is trying to determine where the metric comes from and is it a valid metric. So you need to spend the time to determine um, does that metric apply or not. So for example, like if it's a performance metric, be aware that maybe during the day the performance requirements may be um, a little different than at night at like 2 a.m. So if someone's using 100% of the bandwidth at 2 a.m., then, you know, you might want to look into it. So, again, there might be some, uh, you know, what I like to call um, <laughs> document reclaiming, basically, where you got users copying stuff that they really shouldn't from corporate resources. So, and again, this happens pretty frequently, so you need to pay attention. 
selection and metrics. So, so it's always good to monitor whatever you can monitor, but you may want to monitor your hosts or your network switches or I, you know, I monitor performance issues, compliance issues, whatever. Just, just because you're monitoring hosts doesn't mean you have to monitor everything on every host. So um, select the right metrics. Um, when you select metrics too, just be aware that um, there may be uh, other areas you want to measure against. Like for example, uh, you might want to reference CERT or NIST for different variables. You may want to reference um, the tool provider as well. Training, right? One of the things that you could do is train your uh, user base on what's acceptable and what's not. Uh, keep keep uh, ahead on what's going on in the industry, right? And then also too, try to uh, try to determine what the threat level uh, is for your company. So prioritize your actions again, simple enough, right? Uh, the reality is is that you can't you really can't you know prioritize everything all the time sometimes you just react it is what it is right uh, we're all busy you know your organizations may be hectic uh, at some times maybe not so try to prioritize your actions also too just because it's a high risk vulnerability what is the likelihood of the impact, right? Is it possible that you know this um, uh, this uh, buffer over overflow exploit can happen? You know, and, and what is the likelihood? So you have to be aware of that. What's the cost, right? Now, one of the challenges that I, I deal with quite a bit, especially around security in the cloud right now, is that a lot of companies don't want to invest in um, responses uh, basically insurance is cheaper but again hopefully your organization's a little different configuration management now this is a this is an interesting area because because here's why generally most cybersecurity folks security folks are not typically involved in change management or configuration management you really should be because one of the things you want to do is be aware of what is being modified in your environment. Because if you're not aware that so-and-so is going to be upgrading SQL to a new version, and then you find out after the fact, that doesn't help your job as a professional security um, expert to, 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 to actually proactively deal with that risk. What's going to happen is that you're going to reactively react to that risk. Again, if you're not aware changes are going on, then it's hard for you to, to, to really be proactive. Be aware of the processes in your organization. There should be a change advisory board. So also, too, one of the things you want to do is, um, and I don't see it listed here, but have a baseline. Uh, anytime there's any software programs, or services being deployed, whatever, have a baseline. Understand what what it is, what's the OS, what is the um, runtime environments, any APIs you gotta be aware of, be aware of that. So develop a rollback plan so things go wrong. Matter of fact, you'll be surprised how many times things can go wrong. Okay. Organizational governance. Now, one of the things that should happen is in your organization, there should be some kind of governance around change. There should be a change advisory board. There should be some kind of um, governance that, you know, has controls in place, whether it's around time or uh, finances, uh, whatever whatever your organization needs, because one of the things you don't want to do is get out of co you know spend too much time or resources on something that you know maybe you shouldn't. And and again, the organization needs to monitor that functionality. Now, functionality is important in the sense that uh, 
you understand that if there are changes that that functionality, um, you know, before that change was working just fine, and then after, uh, there could be some issues that uh, degrade that service. Contract obligations. Now, one of the things you, oh, for the test, you definitely want to know these three um, contractual obligations. So make sure you know what memorandum, uh, uh, okay, let me say that, right? Memorandum of understanding. So this is a generally a exploratory agreement that sort of shows an intent to work together. It's uh, not a contract. Uh, it, it doesn't usually have a binding approach to it, but again, it's, it's basically saying we're going to cooperate, work together, but we're not going to sign the papers yet. So it's sort of like uh, where you and your significant other move in uh, together and get an apartment, but you don't get married. <laughs> so that's sort of the memorandum of understanding, right? A service level agreement. Now, this is where this is a contractual agreement where the terms are actually specified and detailed on how you and the provider are going to work together. And then a KPI. Those are um, you know, similar to service metrics, and, and actually they're typically the same thing, but sometimes telecom companies, sometimes cloud providers and VARs, they sort of call the same thing different terms. So KPI or a metric is what this is going to be um, you know, again, a specific uh, uh, metric is is really what you're looking for here um, that you're going to uh, specify uh, in the uh, SLA. So, for example, what is the metric for uptime? Is it 99.99%? What is the response time? Is it four hours? So the metric um, should be um, detailed. I also like to refer... The, to the KPIs as the speeds and feeds. So those are the numbers generally that you're going to want to uh, attend to. Servers. So once again, um, you want to be aware that um, with uh, servers, you should, uh, should definitely be aware uh, of a couple things. So for example, if you have a server, what is the um, vulnerability scope or what is the attack vectors? What is the uh, basically the endpoints or, or the, um, the, the weak points? So what is the entry point to the server? What are the ports open? What are the services? So again, just understand servers are definitely going to be attack points and you want to know what exactly you need to protect. Now, one of the things that's recommended to a server is just have a baseline. Um, usually when servers are deployed in an enterprise, you're going to have typically templates and baselines set up. Blueprints, um, they should be deployed with images. And and, and again, if, if there's major changes to the servers, you want to update the images. But again, you as a security professional won't probably be doing that. That'll be the host folks. So uh, you need to work together in a lot of cases. Endpoint. So what's an endpoint? So an endpoint, again, is basically going to be an access point to a corporate network. And generally, an endpoint, uh, when we talk about like cloud computing or mobile devices, this is basically an API that uh, is going to, to be used. So, for example, with mobile device management, this could be a huge area of weakness in your organization, so pay attention to that. 